It will make sense later. Recently, I read a book and it made such an impression on me that I felt I need to record a video to brag about it. You may think that's because it was especially complicated, hard to read, or maybe it was so big in sheer volume that made me feel accomplished after reading it. It was neither big nor complicated. The lasting impression comes from the fact that it describes the workings of the most omnipresent, omnipotent and omniscient device of our times. The device that provides means of work, communication, entertainment and the nudes of your girlfriend. You know, progress. And at the same time, for the most of us, it's a black box. We're no longer in position of understanding the consumer devices that we own. It's no longer small scale technology like electric bulb. And the fact that I can work as a software developer with the ignorance of this bottom most fundamental and crucial layer of the technology stack is weird. There are so many layers of abstraction over the hardware and even the operating system that you can almost forget that everything boils down to the logic gates down below. But who is to blame if achieving skill in even a few of these layers is a lifetime task? The book in question is called The Elements of Computing Systems and a quote from its introduction will summarize this best. Once upon a time, every computer specialist had a gestalt understanding of how computers worked. The overall interactions among hardware, software compilers and the operating system were simple and transparent enough to produce a coherent picture of computers' operations. As modern computer technologies have become increasingly more complex, this clarity is all but lost. The fundamental ideas and techniques in computer science, the very essence of the field, are now hidden under many layers of obscure interfaces and proprietary implementations. An inevitable consequence of this complexity has been specialization leading to computer science curricula of many courses, each covering a single aspect of the field. We wrote this book because we felt that many computer science students are missing the forest for the trees. The typical student is marshaled for a series of courses in programming theory and engineering without pausing to appreciate the beauty of the picture at large. And the picture at large is such that hardware and software systems are tightly interrelated through a hidden web of abstractions, interfaces and contract-based implementations. Failure to see this intricate enterprise in the flesh leaves many students and professionals with an easy feeling that, well, they don't fully understand what's going on inside computers. What's so special about this book is that you learn how the CPU works by building one and the book gives you both instructions and the tools to do so. The instructions boil down to get the NAND gate because the NAND gate is the building block of every other logic gate, build the NOT and OR and XOR gates from it, then test them in the simulator shipped with the book and then repeat. Build even more complicated blocks from the blocks you just built, for example multiplexer, demultiplexer, register, RAM. ALU and finally on top of it CPU and everything from the topmost to the bottommost module can be simulated and tested against the truth table shipped with the book. And here's the best part. So far I described only the first half of the book. The second half of the book is about providing software for the CPU, for example writing your own assembler or a compiler for a kind of a high level language or even writing a primitive operating system. And if you have a feeling that's too much for a single book Yes, the book only scratches the surface of most of the topics and that's all right. It's an introduction. It's an entry-level book that assumes you can do your own research uh, if you want to explore some topic further. So I built a CPU from logic gates and it was great even though the design wasn't mine and it was more like assembling a Lego structure from a manual. But I wasn't fully satisfied. The CPU could work only on top of my computer and it was defined in an arbitral language made for the purpose of this book and its simulator and I wanted to make the CPU physical, I wanted to put my hands on it, possibly even connect peripherals like a PS2 keyboard or a VGA monitor. I knew there are those devices called FPGAs, I never used one, but it felt like they have something to do with programming logic gates, as it's literally in the name. And after all, what I was doing was exactly this, programming logic gates. I was defining which pin of some logic gate connects to which pin of another logic gate in an arbitrary hardware definition language 
HDL that was specifically made for this book. And it turns out FPGAs are exactly the same. They have their own HDL called Verilog, but the circuit defined on it can be put on an actual hardware, on an FPGA board that is a matrix of logic gates that is wired in a way you define in Verilog. So it is the closest thing to put this processor on an actual hardware without buying a lot of breadboards and building it like Ben Eater does. So I bought an FPGA board. I didn't know which one is supposed to be the best at the moment, so I bought the one with a lot of pinouts because I knew I want to visualize the registries of the CPU with a lot of LEDs. Additionally, it came with a VGA connector, so I could even build a simple video card. For getting familiar with Verilog, I started reading this book and generally started toying with the examples shipped with the FPGA board. By trial and error, I started implementing each module of the computer in isolation. An example, the clock module with buttons, so I could either debug the computer cycle by cycle or let it go automatically. Or the ALE, where I connected dip switches to toy with the opcode and operand values with LEDs to visualize them. Eventually, I moved the computer into a cardboard frame because it was getting bigger and bigger with each component finished and wired to the others. Overall, the transition from the simulator to Verilog took surprisingly short, to the point where my previous impression of FPGAs as those hardcore devices for the elite and more electronics-oriented people shattered into pieces. Here's a diagram of finished design generated from Verilog. Big rectangle in the center is the CPU. Zoomed in, you can see the ALU, two 16-bit registers named A and D, and a 16-bit program counter, which technically is also a register which value is incremented each cycle. Program counter value is connected to the instruction memory. Instruction memory outputs the 16-bit instruction value at the address stored by program counter during the previous cycle. The A registry, where A comes from address, works in a similar way. The value it stores is passed to data memory module, which I'll call as RAM module interchangeably. If the program needs to read or store in RAM, it sets the value of the A registry with the address, and in the next cycle, the value is available as an operand for ALU. RAM module is also connected to the visual module. Some address space, namely the first 1200 bits, are used as a frame buffer for the video. You can probably figure out why it's 1200. Screen resolution is 40 by 30 monochromatically. This is so-called memory mapping, a method commonly used in the first personal computers, for example Apple II or Commodore 64, to access peripherals like screen or keyboard. Because of that, blinking a pixel on the screen is a matter of writing to the memory. I don't support PS2 keyboard yet, but when I do, likewise, checking whether the key is pressed or not will be a matter of reading some address in the memory that is shared with the circuit for scanning keys. As a last thing, there's the clock module. It's just the FPGA clock with an additional counter to artificially achieve slower clock speed and the two buttons. The big question still is. How does the computer think? To answer it, I'll need to briefly review the two instruction types that the computer supports. There's the A-type instruction with each bit as in the diagram. The first bit is to differentiate between the two instructions, 0 for A, 1 for C. The remaining 15 bits are assigned to the A registry. That's all. A-type instruction is done. Here's the C-type instruction, which does the actual heavy lifting. Again, first bit is to differentiate, the next two are unused, the fourth bit decides what value is used as the second operand to the ALU, either D registry or RAM. The next six bits are the opcode passed to the ALU, we'll get back to that in a moment. Then the next three bits are the destination, where the output of the ALU will be stored, either A registry, D registry or in RAM. And the last three bits decide what to do next. You can define whether to conditionally jump or not, and what's the condition. In example, jump if the output was equal to zero, greater than zero, smaller than zero, and so on. Getting back to the ALU upcode. The first bit, if set, zero is the first operand. The second bit, if set, negates the first operand. The third and fourth are the same, but for the second operand, the fifth decides whether to add or and the operands. The sixth, if set, negates the final output. That's all. There's nothing more. From these simple principles, you get a working computer. 
Each cycle an instruction is fetched based on the program counter value. Some parts of the instruction like the 6-bit opcode are passed directly to the ALU, some are processed by a few logic gates like the A-bit deciding about the operand, and that's how the program is executed. It struck me how this is just a big puzzle that makes an impression of intelligence. Because the design is compatible with the book, not including memory mapping yet, I can use the assembler that is shipped with it. Here is an example program that blinks some pixels on the screen in a loop. The value in the first line comes from the fact that this number in binary makes 1 and 0 pattern. So I get the binary form of instructions out of the mnemonics and copy it to the instruction memory module in Verilog. This loop of copying, assembly and then synthesizing on the FPGA board takes time, but at this small scale of programs I don't have much incentive to automatize this. Let's track execution of this program on an FPGA board. Assigning value to A registry, assigning D with A, using address 0, assigning D to this address, using address 1, assigning D to this address, using address 0, assigning 0 to this address, using address 1, assigning 0 to this address, setting jump address, jumping, and back again, program counter value changed, starting from just after the infinite loop label. Damn, I miss the times when registry state was displayed on the computer itself. I was thinking of coming up with some specifications of this computer like amount of memory or the clock speed, but it doesn't really make sense if it depends on the FPGA board that is running the design. Anyway, I don't have any big plans of writing my own piece of software for this computer or coming up with a CPU design of my own. It's just a nice exercise and I'll leave it that way. Peace out.